Hello friends! For today's video, I wanted to go through a list of some popular and well-loved adult fantasy works, and then give some recommendations for some either lesser-known adult fantasy, some young adult books, or in one case, a video game. But I'm gonna go ahead and start with just a regular basic adult fantasy work, and then a counterpart that is also adult fantasy, actually two counterparts. And that would be if you like Shadow of the Gods by John Gwynn, then check out Genevieve Gornachek. You can check out both The Weaver and the Witch Queen and The Witch's Heart, as both of these have similar settings. So many of you are probably familiar with Shadow of the Gods, but if you don't know the setup for this one, it is a fantasy world that is loosely inspired by Norse mythology, and I think John Gwen does a really great job of giving nods to the mythology, but not relying on it for his fantasy world. He's very much building the world up with its own lore, with its own really rich, interesting history, and then of course with a fantastic setting that you absolutely feel transported to. And the setup is that you follow three main perspectives in the first story, two of whom are on somewhat of revenge slash missing persons quests, and then another who is trying to establish themselves, and you're not sure why or who it is they're trying to impress, but the more you learn about that character, the more interesting their plot gets. I have said so many times that I definitely think the main characters trade the spotlight really well and they expand. You get more perspectives in the sequel. I am very much anticipating that third book. But in the meantime, if you, like me, are waiting for the third story in this, then it'd be the perfect time to check out these other two because they both also have more of the Norse setting. So with The Weaver and The Witch Queen, that one's going to feel a lot more like historical fantasy, and it doesn't have as much of the same kind of lore and magic as something like Shadow of the Gods, but the setting itself is quite similar. And I thought that the way that the, the cold very much gripped you, that the customs of the people, the way those played out, and how it creates a lot of gray morality in the story, I thought it was done very well. And I would say that's a very similar thing, a similar compliment I would give Shadow of the Gods, is how much you look at the characters and you like the characters and you root for them, but then when you really reflect on it, you're like, they're really... they, they take part in or benefit from some pretty bad things or horrible circumstances for other people. I think that's very true anytime you're looking at anything that it's even slightly historical in nature. So I like that both of these authors don't really shy away from that gray morality. And then in Witch's Heart, this one is like if you want more of the lore, if you want more of the mythology and you want to dive into a story that explores that, that's more of what you're going to get with this one, as it is very much a story of the gods and somebody who is caught in the middle of of them. And so you have the main character, Angra Boda, who has the gift of foresight, and she is trying to live in isolation and keep to herself and keep hidden because Odin wants this gift for himself. And as a result of living in isolation, she very much has learned how to be happy on her own, how to survive, how to live off the land. And one day Loki finds her and they become friends and then eventually they become wed. And then you're seeing what happens when Angra Boda's loved ones are put in danger and everything she's willing to do to protect them. Something that I think really enhanced the story is the ending, and there's one specific line at the end that sort of shifted my perspective of the whole story. I've chatted with some friends who feel very similar about that, and I think if you're somebody who's looking for a story with parents, this one and Shadow of the Gods has characters, specifically mother characters, that are gonna do anything to protect their children. So if you are looking for that in your fantasy, it's going to deliver within both of those books. After that, we have the one that is actually a video game recommendation. I couldn't help it. I just had to include it on this list because I love this book and I love this video game and I'm sure a lot of you will as well. And that would be if you enjoyed You, Me, and the Nightmare Painter. You already know what I'm gonna say you gotta play Final Fantasy X. So many of you know that Final Fantasy X pretty much started my obsession with fantasy. I love it so much. I love it so much. And if you put that game on, I will say the dialogue either right before the characters say it or as they're saying it, and I will sing along to the music, and I'll probably want to start crying as soon as I hear the Xanarkin themed. It's just so good. It's so good. And the story of Final Fantasy X is that you follow a young man who is a star athlete, which I feel like 
is such a, every time I actually describe the plot, I'm like, it's so bizarre, but he's a star athlete in this fantasy land called Xanarkand. And he ends up at the very beginning being transported to what seems like an entirely different world, only to find out that it is supposedly his world a thousand years in the future. However, life has not gotten better. Life has gotten much worse. And it seems there's some kind of apocalyptic event that has occurred that has led to this more dire situation for all of the world known as Spira. And the thing that caused this apocalyptic event is this being known as Sin. Even if people destroy Sin, it always comes back and they don't really know what to do. They are trying to atone for whatever it is that has caused Sin and thus far it has not worked. And Titus finds that his path crosses with a young summoner named Yuna who is trying to to herself defeat Sin along with the aid of these powerful beings known as Aeons. And so Titus becomes one of her guardians along with a whole bunch of other characters and you follow them as they are trying to not only defeat Sin, but also trying to give hope to people along the way. It's so good. <laughs> I love it so much. And if you yourself are not really a gamer, you can find like all the cutscenes on YouTube <laughs> and you can watch. I just, it's so good. And I have always said, I need to find a book that does something like Final Fantasy in book form, like Final Fantasy X specifically, because there's a lot of them. <laughs> and Yumi definitely does. So the setup for this one is that you follow a young man who goes by painter. That is his profession. It's also what you see him refer to himself as throughout the story for quite a while. And Painter is just kind of very down on himself. He doesn't really feel like he plays a very big role in society. He feels like he doesn't have a whole lot of a purpose and he's very much to himself. He doesn't really have a lot of friends. And one day his life crosses paths with a woman named Yumi, a young woman who has a lot of religious significance, you could say, or at least you could say there's a lot of reverence toward her as she is able to summon these spirit beings through artwork that she does. This seems like an entirely different world, maybe even a different planet than Painter's. And on his planet, it seems much more like it is the future, like there's a lot more advancements. You can't tell if they're in a different time and that's why, or if it has to do with them being on a different planet and the different setting. But his world is very different from Yumi's. They end up kind of in each other's worlds and also in some ways in each other's bodies but it's different depending on who is in whose world. And you're trying to unravel this mystery alongside the characters and you're watching as they get to know each other and it makes them grow, it makes them reflect on themselves, they push each other, they care about each other and it's so sweet and it's so cute and the world is so interesting. And so many of the things that I love about Final Fantasy X are true of Yumi and then of course in reverse. The things that I liked about Yumi are obviously present in Final Fantasy X as well. Next up, we have God Killer and Witcher. So obviously Witcher is the very, very popular one here. God Killer, I have now recommended it so many times alongside Witcher because the plot, while the plot itself is very different, it is the relationship between the characters that I think really reminded me of the other, as well as the profession of the main characters. So many of you know, and probably don't need to hear much about Witcher, you follow a monster hunter named Geralt, whose life is intertwined with a young princess named Ciri and a sorceress named Yennefer. And you can't really figure out if it is fate, if it is destiny, or if it just happens to be the way that their lives cross paths. You don't really know, but they do regardless. And so you're following them as they are navigating a very war-torn land, as they have to try to make do in a world where the very whims of the nobles cause such a strong ripple effect that has such negative consequences on everyone else. So you explore that in a very historical fantasy land. And then in God Killer, you have a character who is a god killer, so not a monster hunter, but a god killer, whose life is very much intertwined with a young girl who is of basically noble birth, and also a man who was previously a very respected soldier, and you're not really sure what his past is, but these three characters find themselves coming together uh, to go on a certain mission. It's a little bit more contained than Witcher. A lot of people, their criticisms 
are that they wish Witcher was a little bit more about the actual Witcher, Geralt, and his relationship with Yennefer and Ciri. And if that is also your criticism, then that will be remedied here in Godkiller, because that is kind of what we're focusing in on, is the relationship between the characters. Also, just the way society treats our main character in Godkiller is similar to how you see people treat Geralt. They think of him kind of as a monster in and of himself, and you see a lot of people think the same thing about our god killer here. After that, we have, if you like Rage of Dragons, which I know is a little bit of a booktube darling, then I would recommend Combat Codes. Both of these are the kinds of stories that follow characters who are kind of consistently leveling up. They are always becoming better at a certain skill. They are trying to improve their fighting prowess. And the circumstances for why are very sad for both of them, but one of them much more shrouded in mystery, and then the other one it's much more to do with trying to get revenge. So in Rage of Dragons, uh, this one follows a young man named Tao who is part of a society with a caste system, and he is pretty much at the bottom. His family is very much mistreated. He doesn't really see himself having much of a, of a good future, but he's just wanting to to live a very simple life. However, as a result of the mistreatment that him and his family face, he now finds that he wants revenge and he wants justice for some bad things that have occurred. And this leads him down a very reckless path. And we see a lot of that in quite a few revenge stories. Is it really worth it? And that's something that you have to ask and that Tao should be asking as he is getting so lost in the pursuit of revenge. You're seeing what it's doing to him. And it's very much about him consistently trying to get better and better and better. If you're somebody who gets frustrated because characters will just all of a sudden be the best of the best and you wish you could see that struggle, that struggle is basically what you're looking at in Rage of Dragons. And then with combat codes, I found the characters to be much more likable. You follow a young boy named Sigo who is in these fighting pits and he doesn't quite know how he got to this point, but he is here and he seems to have a lot of gift when it comes to fighting. And he remembers being mentored and he remembers practicing fighting. He just doesn't know how he got to this point. And so he is in a very difficult situation where he is heavily mistreated and his fighting against other children is pretty much for the entertainment of other people in society. And it is through the way that this is shown to other people that an older soldier sees Seago and sees something in Seago and feels compelled to step in and do what he can to help him and help him have a better life. You see as you get a little bit of a mentor-mentee relationship. And while the main characters are quite different in both of these, it is that consistent struggle and that constant pursuit of the betterment of yourself and what you're capable of, that's where the similarities lie. Next up, if you're a fan of Robin Hobb and specifically the Farseer trilogy, then I would recommend checking out The Pariah by Anthony Ryan. One, I already kind of think that these authors have similar writing styles where they're a, a little bit more formal almost in a sense. And I really like the writing of both of these authors, but it's a kind of writing style that does not necessarily motivate you to read quickly. You sort of just kind of almost need to take a second to fully immerse yourself in their worlds. And sometimes they aren't really writing a whole lot in the way of plot, but you're just sort of settling in and you're experiencing things alongside the characters. So I think the way that both of them tell a story is similar, but then very specifically, I find that it's the lack of agency that both of the characters have and the way in which they find themselves gravitating towards people in power and always kind of getting caught up in whatever those people are doing, that the characters in both of these have those similar sorts of arcs. So you're not really following a character who's on a mission. You're not really seeing something very drastically different like what I just described with Rage of Dragons and Combat Codes where it's fighting, fighting, fighting all the time. It's sort of like characters that are like, okay, those people are interesting. So your main character ends up sort of around the interesting person and they just follow along with what they're doing. And then because of plot stuff, now all of a sudden they're over here and they're following this person, but they really liked this person. They don't really like following this person and it sort of bums them out, but they gotta do what they gotta do. And you just, you just follow them as they follow other people. So it's interesting. It's a different way to go about uh, a character's life, but that lack of agency is something I think a lot of authors are afraid to write for fear of it being a little bit more boring or people not loving it. And 
I do think that there is a certain audience for that. If you can pull it off, it's a very different kind of story. After that, if you... Okay, the thunder is really loud right now. If that is distracting, I apologize. The book I'm about to mention is Fourth Wing, and it's like... It's like even the weather is laughing. Fourth Wing. If you really liked Fourth Wing, then might I recommend Fireborn by Rosaria Munda. I have recommended these two in relation to each other, and you must forgive me, Fireborn is much more up my alley than Fourth Wing. Luna's here to give her two cents as well. She agrees. I think the thunder scares her or something because she is so cute and she just laid down right next to me. But anyway, focusing back in on the books here, Fourth Wing is fantasy romance. You follow a character named Violet or Vi for short, who goes to this school that is supposed to potentially make her bonded to a dragon and this school values strength above all else and Vi is somebody who was not trained to go to the school but she's kind of forced into it and so the stakes are incredibly high right from the start. The stakes are constantly raised. The stakes are always really over the top even if they don't always make a whole lot of sense but it does push the story along and if you like dragon fantasy, then this one is going to definitely fit the bill. If you want fantasy romance, this one will definitely fit the bill. However, if you're like, okay, I like the school setting and I like the dragons, but I want maybe less romance. I want things to be a lot more about the politics and examining trauma and also looking into the different forms of government and what it would look like after a bloody revolution, what's left and what happens when the new form of government maybe isn't all that much better than the previous, what does that look like? Then that's Fireborn and Fireborn is so much more <laughs> my cup of tea. Fourth Wing is kind of like just pure entertainment and I personally think Fireborn is much more reflective and introspective and it asks really interesting questions and there's a lot of nods to things like Plato's Republic and other such kind of classics and uh, Greek philosophy and things like that. So it's funny because while this one is YA, uh, I think it's much more mature and this one is just pure fun. It's just pure fun and pure entertainment. But anyway, that's it for today. I'm going to go comfort my dog as she seems unsure about the thunder and the rain. Let me know if you have, though, any of your own recommendations for if you like a certain popular adult fantasy, what would go along with that, and then also if you have any recommendations for the specific books that I talked about. But anyway, thanks so much for watching. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you later. Bye. Let's look at Luna Bear. Hi, Bear. Are you okay? Hi, little one. Are you happy now that you're getting pets? Yeah. Oh. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, snort. <laughs> it's okay. You want a snacky? Will that make it all better? Do you want a snacky? Okay, let's go get one.